So it started just over 25 years ago when I began developing an interest in hereditary cancer and came across a family where a young boy had the gene on the basis of his, some physical features but hadn't yet developed the polyps that would predispose him to cancer and it struck me that this was an ideal study population for interventions that might prevent cancer. Uh, and particularly as we've learned more about first that condition called familial polyposis uh, and then subsequently Lynch syndrome where there's a breakdown of mismatch repair uh, uh, genes. Basically these are sort of model systems for the common ca forms of, of hereditary cancer, particularly bowel cancer. Uh, and so if, if you lose uh, an APC gene through inheritance, it predisposes to polyp formation and cancer. Uh, if you can prevent that person developing cancer, then you're probably going to have a similar effect in people who develop sporadic cancer through that same mechanism. Uh, and in CAP2, in CAP1 we focused on FAP, in CAP2 our trial focused on Lynch syndrome and here you've got a breakdown in, in DNA repair systems. Again, that accounts for about one in six of sporadic cancers. So if we can protect the Lynch syndrome population, then we could potentially also have an impact on the general population with those more common cancers. Yes, yeah, so Lynch syndrome is, is actually a poor relation to uh, the breast cancer genes. Everyone's heard of BRCA1 and BRCA2. There are a group of four key genes called the mismatch repair genes, common throughout the animal and plant kingdom. Their job is to spell check your DNA as you copy it. Uh, and uh, if you get slippage, particularly in bits of repetitive DNA, so if you've got, say, 10 A's in a row, you might end up with 9 or 11, and that completely wrecks the genes. So there's a very elaborate... Uh, molecular system for spell checking and correcting those slips. If you lose that system, you start picking up spelling mistakes in key genes. Uh, and obviously if you take out some of your tumour suppressor genes, that can then lead to cancer. And so Lynch syndrome is effectively a familial form of cancer where you get from an early age, kicking off around about the age of 25 typically, colon cancer, endometrial cancer, ovarian, gastric, renal, a whole range of different tumours. So the the bowel and endometrium make up the, the bulk of the cancers. So back in the late 80s, it was apparent that people who took non-steroidal anti-inflammatory seemed to get less cancer, particularly those who took aspirin. And we were looking for something to try out in our hereditary cancer population. Uh, and that was one of two interventions that we started out with, the other being resistant starch, uh, which has an impact on bowel uh, development, which it turned out not to work in our trial, but it, it was probably a useful additional feature because it slowed us down and it meant that we ended up with a lot of long-term follow-up data because it took us so long to do the trial. So we began designing CAP1 in about 1990 and CAP2 in 1993 because we were there at the beginning of the discovery of the mismatch repair genes. Uh, and we actually got rolling with CAP2, as it became known, uh, in 1998 and finished recruiting in 2006 and in fact this year the last recruits reached their uh, 10th anniversary which was the planned end follow-up uh, for the study. We took a look at the data or a look at the patient long-term follow-up when the first of them reached 10 years and what we found was that the people who had taken two aspirins a day for a minimum of two years as was the original plan uh, had a, a reduction in their cancer rates of about 50%. And that was apparent not only in the colorectal cancers, but in fact across all the cancers associated with the syndrome, uh, which came as a great surprise. Uh, well, not entirely as a surprise, because it fitted with the epidemiology, but it was delightful to see a similar impact. What was surprising was we didn't see a particularly big impact on polyp formation. So at the end of the treatment phase, we were a, a bit demoralized because we expected there to be a reduction in the number of polyps as well, and that, that wasn't apparent. We now think what's happening in Lynch syndrome is that you're probably getting a progression down a slightly different pathway to that which we've become used to, where people generally think of polyps forming, taking several years to eventually become a cancer. What probably happens in Lynch syndrome is you get loss of mismatch repair function in the crypts, in the lining of the colon, and then they accumulate mis mistakes in stem cells, which then pretty, very rapidly progress to become malignant cells and effectively emerge as cancers. They then take a long time to, to metastasize because one of the effects of this uh, mechanism is you tend to lose key genes like B2M, which are critical for your HLA expression. Now that's quite useful in terms of local tissue expansion, 
but if you try and metastasize, you get picked up by the state police, the T killer cells, and they don't like cells without HLA types, so they're t taken out. So basically, these cells become cancers, then sit around for a long time as a cancer, uh, and it seems that the aspirin is having a fairly dramatic effect on that process. But what, again, this dramatic thing we're seeing with the Lynch syndrome patients, as indeed has been seen in all the epidemiological studies of aspirin, is there's some kind of delay from when you start taking the aspirin to the beneficial effect, about a three to five year gap. So what we think is probably happening is that the aspirin's having an impact on, on apoptotic mechanisms in terms of aberrant stem cells, that it's helping you to take out the cells that will become cancer one day. It's also probably having a direct effect on other mechanisms like new vessel formation uh, and the direct immunological response to the tumour itself. So it's a kind of dirty drug that's hitting the system at multiple different levels. Uh, and what's really fascinating in a way is that we've found this effect and now we have to work out the explanation. It's like the old Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You know, the, life, the, the, life, the, the answer to life, the universe and everything is 42. Now work out the question. So we know that aspirin prevents cancer but we still don't actually know why. Uh, and that's really quite challenging because without knowing the mechanism, we can't think about interactions and so on with other drugs. We can't think about whether we can change the dose. So in CAP3, we're testing three different doses and that trial started last uh, two years ago almost. Uh, and we're up to 776 recruits of the minimum 1500 that we need. And what we're doing in CAP3 is randomizing people to receive either the 600 milligrams we use in CAP2, 300 milligrams, it's one standard aspirin a day, or 100 milligrams of enteric coated, which is the, the sort of cardiovascular baby aspirin. And the idea is to look at those three doses and look at enough people over a period of five years to see whether taking two aspirins a day gives you the same level of protection or a greater level of protection than taking a baby aspirin or the intermediate dose. Clearly, if we can demonstrate that the baby dose has as big an effect on cancer protection or prevention as the two aspirins a day, we can move to the safer, lower dose uh, in terms of population treatment. So it'll add to the case for general use of aspirin as a cancer preventive, but particularly we can then go for uh, a big push to get people with this hereditary predisposition and other people with a high risk to take aspirin as a routine standard protection. Well, I think if you, if you look at the epidemiological and now clinical trial data, our CAP2 trial and the Women's Health Study, which also used cancer as an endpoint and which on review showed a beneficial effect of low-dose aspirin from 10 years onwards. So we've got two randomised trials, one in a high-risk population, one in a general population, using different doses, both of which show an effect. So to be honest, the evidence is now dramatically stronger for using aspirin than it is for using colonoscopy, uh, which we all just accept is the right thing to do for people who are at increased risk of bowel cancer. So I think the answer is we should be using it. We need to repurpose aspirin. The problem is that the legislation is such, has been such that it's very difficult to get a drug repurposed. Uh, it's, it's one thing to take it through for a license for one application, but if it's already got a license and it's already off patent, there's no one stimulated to actually get it a, a license for another use. But we're hoping to take advantage of the recent legislative changes in the UK for innovative drugs, uh, which will allow us to potentially get aspirin repurposed. In the meantime, we've already got a recommendation from our uh, European uh, hereditary tumour group, of which I'm a member, that aspirin should be drawn to people's attention with Lynch syndrome. Uh, and similarly, the American Gastroenterological Association have now uh, recommended that uh, aspirin be uh, offered to people with Lynch syndrome, accepting that the evidence is quite weak because we only have one randomised trial, but given the rarity of the condition, that's pretty good to have even one randomised trial. And it's not actually it's not that rare. We think probably about one in every thousand people will manifest Lynch syndrome. Uh, so that means that, you know, in a population like of, of our size, that's 60,000, 70,000 people. It's not a trivial condition in its own right. Uh, so I think we should be pushing ahead with using aspirin now in that highest risk group. But I think one could take a, as a reasonable guide, given that the side effects of aspirin in a non-frail population are about the same as the side effects of colonoscopy.
So in other words, your risk of getting a serious bleed or a perforation or a death from a colonoscopy, small but real, is about the same as a, an ulcer or an intracranial bleed associated with aspirin. It's about one in 10,000 people, which is not to be ignored, but it, if you are at a high risk of cancer, it's a risk you may well be prepared to take. And I think that if someone is, is worthy of having colonoscopy regularly, then there's a very powerful argument for saying that the similar case could be made for giving them aspirin uh, and certainly making them aware of the beneficial effects. It's still really quite hard to break through the old thing that it's, it's, it's what we think we know already that prevents us from learning, uh, as Claude Bernard, the physiologist, once said. So most doctors think they know everything about aspirin. And so, in fact, studies have recently shown that uh, a majority of them still aren't recognising this highly protective effect of, of anything up to 50% reduction in bowel cancers. Uh, and the other thing is that doctors generally overestimate the side effects. And that's partly because we tend to see elderly people who've been left on aspirin forever presenting with life-threatening bleeds in their 80s and 90s. Uh, and that tends to sort of skew our effect, our impression of the effects of aspirin, which are otherwise quite mild in, in the vast majority of healthy people. I think the only one thing I would say is that if anyone is looking after patients with Lynch syndrome in the UK, every genetic centre in Britain is now open for business uh, and any adult with Lynch syndrome who doesn't have a major intercurrent illness or is already on anti-inflammatories is eligible to take part. So we need about a fifth of all the Lynch syndrome patients in the country that are known to us. So we basically need as many as possible to be made aware of this. But given that there's no placebo group, and they're learning something of relevance to their own future healthcare and that of their family. Uh, we're finding a pretty strong response so far, so I'm hoping that most will come forward.